for those who have just logged on, you're at the right place. We are continuing our Bible study series under the context of the present truth. The present truth is biblical, right? 1 Peter 1, 12, Peter says that we should be established in the present truth. And the present truth is nothing more than the truths for this time. And we believe that the, that the Seventh-day Adventist Church, God has gifted them with the messages for this time for them to share to the world. Now, we're on lesson number 11, and we hope you have your lessons um, printed out. If not, again, just jot them down. Friends, we are making the PowerPoints available. Reach out to us. We know that there are some people who are using them, and we praise God for you guys. We praise God for the Brother Harris and his wife down there in Portland, who they have sent me videos, man. They are actually, I've seen them teaching the lessons. Praise God, and we hope that we know, I hope we know that um, these things will not return unto you void. And we, we, we pray God's blessing upon you and your family, right? Now, lesson number 11, Earth's Last Call. Again, we're looking at the three angels' messages, but just from, remember, these people are not familiar with these concepts. So these, we're teaching these three angels just from a broad concept because we want to get your student now to, um, to be, to be um, exposed to certain buzzwords in the Bible. So when we get to these lessons, they can say, oh, I remember what those angels warned us against not to receive, right? Now, what's the lesson objective? We have to know where we're going. The lesson's objective is introduced to introduce the student to God's last message of mercy to a dying world. God's last message of mercy to a dying world. Now, so now please read now throughout, this is our, remember, Every lesson we have an introduction, and the introduction now serves to bridge, to introduce the content of the message. Now, throughout history, go ahead. Throughout history, God sent special messages before special events were to occur. God sent a special message by Noah to the world of his day. He sent two angels to bear a special message to the inhabitants of Sodom. He heralded a special message by the voice of John the Baptist crying in the wilderness, and preparing the way for Christ's first coming. Today, as we stand before the grand climax of the ages, the second coming of Christ, God is sending a final message to men to prepare for that event. And friends, you want to emphasize the fact that this is the last message of mercy that God is sending to the inhabited worlds. And when these messages have finished their work, there will be no, no more, right? There will be no more, right? Now, question number one in your handout says, now, what symbol does God use to preach his last day message to the world? What symbol? Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12, we're looking for a symbol. Remember, the book of Revelation is a book of symbols, right? Look at what it, it says now, right? Revelation 14, 6 says now, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, unto every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory, for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city because she had made all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed him saying, if, with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast or his image and receive his mark in their forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Friends, the symbol that God used to constitute his last day message, fill it in now, are three angels. Now, we must know that the book of Revelation is a book of symbols. So obviously these angels must be a symbol, a representation of some great movement people. Note now, Angels in both the Hebrew and the Greek signifies messengers. Emphasize this, right? These three angels of Revelation 14, 6 to 12 are evidently symbolic of a work assigned them 
that of the preaching of the everlasting gospel to the people. Both the preaching of the gospel has both, but, sorry, but the preaching, thank you, but the preaching of the gospel has not been entrusted to literal angels. Now it is true, angels may create, are used at times, but, that, but this message, this last appeal is not given to angels. They are used in representation, but they are given to humans, right? It has been committed to man. Men in the generic sense mean mankind, both male and female, who are responsible for the sacred trust placed in their hands. Each of these three angels therefore symbolize a body of religious teachers who are commissioned to make known to their fellow men the special truths which constitute the burden of these messages respectively. So friends, the truths for this time that God has given to us is symbolized as angels. He has used the symbolism of angels. Now, number two now, right? How universal are these messages and to whom are they sent? How universal? Look at the text. In verse 6, it tells us how wide the, the, the far-reachingness of the message. Verse 6 says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, right? And to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So what's the answer? Fill it in now. They go to the entire world. Wherever there is a populace, a people group, they need to hear these messages. It goes to every nation. Every nation. You know, the UN has over 100, I think, and 30-something nations represented when you go to the UN. And I think there's only like, what, eight languages or four, four eight languages spoken there. So if the you know, language, you have to get a headset. But the point is, every God expects every people group, every nation to hear these messages, right? Every nation, every kindred, every tongue. Tongue in the Greek means dialectos. Whether you speak French, Dutch, German, Portuguese, Suhali, whatever your language is, God is going to make sure that this message is, 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 is interpreted or translated transcribe in your language so you can read it or he will send a preacher give them the gift of tongues use an interpreter whereby you can hear these messages because after all these are the last messages that God has given to the world and my teacher would oftentimes say boy what part of last don't you understand the LA or the ST and to every people so it takes in the entire globe this is a work and friends FYI, God has raised us up. Friends, we have a lot of work to do and we have a short time to do it. And that is why now is not the time for us to be becoming so engrossed in, in, in secular things. You know, we, we have to work, don't get me wrong. If we shouldn't work, we shouldn't eat, we got to pay our bills. But friends, these things should just be a means of facilitating us whereby we can get these message out whether in print, whether in song, whether in sermon. And if we ourselves can't go, we can, we, can, we can help sponsor Bible workers. We can help sponsor evangelists. We can help support young people who have a desire to go where you can go. There are several ways we can promulgate these messages. But by and by, one of the most effective ways we can do it is by a life well lived, yes, but in also giving Bible studies, right? So the entire goal. Now, people, right now. To show its worldwide extent, this message is sim symbolic, symbolically described as given by three angels flying in the midst of heaven, calling men everywhere. Now let's now examine these messages. Now friends, what's our objective? We are not trying to go deep <clears throat> because we're going to cover these messages. We're going to resort back to them. We just want to get our students familiar with the three angels' messages. So as we proclaim the Sabbath, the judgment, the mark of the beast, you can say, remember lesson 11, the angel warned you not to receive the mark of the beast. Oh yes, or oh, that angel called you to worship God who made as the Sabbath. So now once they are familiar with what these messages are, as, you, as we progress in the series now, 
as we hit these testing truths, now we can always resort back to God's last appeal. Make sense? All right, now, so we're going to break down the three, these three angels just from a biblical perspective. We're not going too deep because, remember, we're dealing with people who are not familiar. These things are foreign. Three angels, what? Well, these things are foreign to them. But we're just giving them enough where the Holy Spirit can begin to work upon their minds so we can always resort back to this lesson. Now, we're going to focus primarily on the first angel, right? Now, we want to read it again. Just to get what this message is. Remember, this is a message that everyone must receive and embrace. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud, underscore, massive, massive speaker voice, Fear God, give him glory. For the hour of his what? Judgment is come. Right? Now, the next lesson we're going to cover is the judgment. Make sense? We're introducing to the fact that there's a judgment, right? And we are to worship him that made the earth, the heaven, and the sea. So when we hit the Sabbath now, guess what? We know who we're worshiping right now. As we're, and again, I wanted to find a very simple way, just a very simple way to teach this. And so we're going to break it down in stages right now. The, 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 the first angel's message has five components, just five. We're going to fill them in, right? We're going to just talk about them. The first one is that now the first angel's message announces what is called, fill it in, the everlasting gospel. Everlasting. Now, note, the word everlasting gospel means that it is everlasting. It means it does not change. In other words, it's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun, right? The gospel preached in the Old Testament is the same preached in the New Testament. Some believe that God in the Old Testament was a little sterner, hard. Man, you, 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 you snooze, you lose. And when Jesus came, you know, you know his hair was long hair. You can put your finger around his hair and curl it here, Jesus. And he's blessing the children. You know, he's forgiving people. And so when we think of Old Testament, we think of wrath. When we think of New Testament, we think of grace. So we think that the Old Testament gospel is a more harder, severer gospel, and the New Testament is a grace gospel. No, this first angel denounced that. It's an everlasting, it means the gospel does not change. And by the way, whenever you see in the Old Testament, FYI, where God um, destroys somebody, it wasn't, it wasn't overnight. These people have been given ample opportunity to change just like you and I right now. So here are some texts we want to emphasize that God doesn't change, right? Hebrews 13, 8 says, For Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and for what? Forever. So the gospel doesn't change. This gospel is old. It's ancient, right? Malachi 3, 6 says, For I am the Lord thy God, I change not. So the first angel is announcing a gospel. And what is the gospel? The acronym, God's only son. I learned this in college. An acronym, gospel, God's only son provides eternal life, right? And so the gospel, the gospel is salvation in Jesus Christ, not by works, lest any man should boast. But once we are saved, we are now inspired and motivated to work, right? The second thing that the first angel highlights, right, is that now, number two, the first angel calls man to fear God. It's in the text. Fear God. Now, we are told, note now, the love of God ever tends to the fear of God. Get that, friends. Fear to offend him. doesn't mean to be afraid of God. Fear to offend him. It means to reverence, to venerate, to treat him with deference or obedience. Such a message is needed today for the world has lost the fear of God. Friends, the world has gone. Somebody says, has the world has gone mad? No, the people have gone mad. The fear of God is banished from people's minds. So this angel is calling people back to fear God, to reverence God, not just God, the things that belongs to God. Reverent God, right? Proverbs 16, verse 6 says, <clears throat> By mercy and truth iniquity is purged. By the fear of the Lord men depart from evil. Friends, light and darkness 
cannot occupy the same space and time at the same time. So guess what now? As we fear God, we, there's no room for us for evil in our hearts. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says now, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. As the wise man is summarizing, as he's summing up life, he says this is the whole duty. Do what? Fear God and to keep his commandments. We've covered the commandments in previous lesson. So a person who really fears God, who really understands the fear of God, fear of the Lord, rightly, rather keeping the commandments, pardon me, is directly uh, connected with the fear of God. So this angel, he's calling back people everywhere to keep the commandments of God. Make sense? Psalms chapter 19 verse 9 says, again, the fear of the Lord is clean. This angel is calling people to cleansiness. You, you've heard the acronym, cleansiness is next to godliness. No, cleansiness is godliness. This angel is, inter, is calling people to a sanitary lifestyle. Clean your home. Clean your car. And if you can't clean it, man, pay somebody to clean it, man. If you can't clean your, keep your house clean, they'll get Molly the maid. Get somebody. They'll clean it for you if you pay them. Keep yourself clean. Keep yourself trim. Brush your teeth. Yes, floss. Go to the dentist. Yes. Hygi hygienic. Baths. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's a practical level. Now you must understand there was a time in history where people took a shower once a month. Yikes. Literally. So here we see that we do serve a clean God. And why is God calling people to be clean? Because, friends, we must understand the hands, someone says, the hands that plans to make another clean must not be dirty. God will not use dirty hands to do clean work. Mr. Spurgeon says, our, our, our lives must be clean. clean. Clean mentality, clean mindset. So when the angel says, fear God, the fear of the Lord means to be clean. It means to keep God's commandment. One of the problems we have today is that there is great confusion where between the sacred and that which is secular. They tend to, the world today has mixed it. They put no difference between the sacred and the secular or between the sacred and the sinful. That which is sacred, men are calling sinful. That which is sinful, men are calling sac uh, sa uh, uh, sacred. And that which is sacred, sometimes we're trying to make sinful. We're trying to blend the two. So this angel is calling people. And listen, let's not think that nobody will respond to this. You'll be surprised. As a matter of fact, there's a story in the book of Acts where Peter, you know, Peter had, had racist issue. And, you know, he was all about for the Jews. And God is trying to purge Peter of his racism. So he gets a vision He's on the roof, he gets a vision, and he sees his sheep come down, and there are all kind of unclean animals. We're going to cover that in an upcoming lecture, right? And by the angel, when he gets a revelation now, the voice says, rise, kill, and eat. And he, Peter says, now, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And the angel said to him, now, you know, what God hath cleansed, no man should call unclean. Then now, guess who where the angel directs him to? The same people whom he was calling unclean. And in Acts chapter 10, Verse 34 now, as Peter meets Cornelius, who was an Italian, he was a Jew, and the Jews taught that the, everybody else outside Judaism was unclean. They were dogs, they were Gentiles, right? Acts 10, 34, the Bible says now, and again, we want you to go to these texts with your student. Peter says, then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is not a respecter of persons, but we are in every nation. He hath him that feareth. In other words, friends, let's not think that this angel will go in vain. That the missionaries who have uh, left their comfort home, of their home, who have left good paying jobs, who have, you know, gave up salaries, broken 401k, sold their homes, and invested heavily in missionary activities, don't think that their labors will be in vain. The Bible says the word will not return unto him void. Right? Somebody will respond to this first angel. I pray that you have responded to it. Right? Note, so we want TP now emphasize the fact, right, that for some people, 
The fear of men is more important than the fear of God. And they turn away from the truth of God and believe a lie. We're calling to fear God, not fear man. Don't fear him that can kill the body only. Fear him that can destroy both body and soul. And we need to shift. This angel is calling us. Some people respect, venerate man to a point where they put what man says above what God says. And you, you see too often in the religious church where a man can see it in the Bible for themselves. Where the Bible says this. And they will say, but my bishop says. What you're doing, you're putting the fear of man above the fear of God. And this angel is debunking that. Stop fearing that man in Rome. You'll be, you'll be surprised. Well, you can't say that today because they may be Catholic. But the point of the matter is that, do you know that there are some people today who venerate the Pope more than God? Yes. In religious circles, there are pastors, there are teachers who are held to such a high esteem that their words are God. They are God themselves. Right? And so, the angel is calling us to fear God. Now, the third thing we want to emphasize about the first, first angel now, the first angel's message call, man's to, call men to give him glory. Fear God and give him glory. Right? What do you mean? Note, the glorifying God means to respect. To glorifying, God, glorifying God has respect to all the persons of the Godhead because God is a family name. It means to respect God the Father. Give him who has given us life. God the Son who lost his life for us. And God the Holy Ghost who produces a new life in us. We must bring glory to the whole Godhead. So we cannot be, there's no thing as glorifying Jesus and, it's not even a word, this glorifying the Holy Ghost. You know what I'm saying? No, and you can't obey one. Well, I'm going to obey Jesus, I'm not going to obey the Holy Ghost. No! They all work together. The Bible says the Godhead, there is no variances. There is no shadow of turning, no duplicity. So when we fear God, we're actually fearing the entire Godhead. And I believe the Holy Ghost is God, right? But it also has an aspect, some practical ways now in which we can fear God, right? Apart from respecting, venerating the Godhead. 1 Corinthians 9, 16. Now again, friends, because of time, I'm going on the screen. But friends, you must. You must have your student find these texts for themselves. Emphasize the words. Circle the words. Expound upon the words. Tarry on the words. Use the word. Speak to the words, right? 1 Corinthians 6.19, Paul says now, What? As if, don't you know? Like a question, like, duh, duh. Like, are you from around here? Like, what? <laughs> know he not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which you have of God, you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, do what? Glorify God in our bodies and in your spirit, which are God. So we are called, practically, we can glorify God by taking care of our bodies that God has given to us. 1 Corinthians 10 tells us now, says now, whether therefore ye eat or whether you drink, whatsoever you do, do what? You do all to the glory of God. Friends, act now, remember, we're not, we're not going into health yet. We're just laying a foundation that we can give God glory by eating and drinking the way that God has prescribed. That's right. Leave it there. Leave it there. God is interested in how we take care of our bodies, right? Note, give, God gives temporal blessings to his children, such as wisdom, riches, and honor. He will give them spiritual blessings. He will give them grace. He will give them his love. He will give them heaven, but his essential glory he will not give to another. That's why whatever we do, we say to God be the glory. When we go and sing and preach and witness and somebody say, praise God, good job. We say no to God. Be the, we always deflect and give it back to God, right? King Pharaoh parted with his ring from his finger and the gold chain for, jo for Joseph, but he would not part with his throne 
Only in the throne will I be greater than thou, Genesis 41.10. So God will do much for his people. He will give them the inheritance. He will put some of Christ's glory as mediator upon them. But his essential glory, he will not part in the throne. He will be greater. And be very careful how we take the glory of God. Go back and look at King Herod. When this man spoke, they said, man, this man is a God. He said, I could, I could imagine Herod said, mm-hmm, say some more, yes, keep on. Ah, yes, I'm a God. And bam, God touched him. Angels smote him and worms eat his body. And Herod's going to bust hell fire wide open. Dum, da, dum, dum, dum. Real truth. Be careful how we, we take the glory of God unto ourselves. And so this angel is begging us, take care of our bodies. But let's not ascribe glory to God to ourselves, right? Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I will not give to another. He's not going to share his glory. And I, 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 I'm afraid of people who have become so glorified in the cause of God that, listen man, when you see them, that like you're seeing God. And that's very, very dangerous. That's very, very dangerous, right? So this angel, it also encourages us, this message rather, to give God glory. Fourth point now. The first angel announces God's judgment. And in the next lesson, we are going to be looking at the judgment, right? The judgment. Fear God and give glory for the hour of his judgment, not shall come or will come, but is come, present tense. We are now in the hour of the judgment. Note, this could not be done unless the time of the judgment was known. The investigative judgment, which is symbolized by the cleansing of the sanctuary, began at the end of the 2,300 day prophecy, Daniel 8.14. We're going to cover all of this. But what we're doing, you're whetting their appetite. Right? And we're going to cover this chart. We're going to break this down so you can teach it, right? Please read on the judgment is serious. The judgment is a serious and solemn matter. The law of God is the standard and Jesus Christ is our advocate. Surely it is high time that we accept the Savior and by his indwelling spirit obey his law. So this angel, the first angel announces the judgment. Now the fifth thing that, the, that, that this angel announces, the first angel, right, calls man to worship the creator. This is so important. The angel said, worship him that made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that there is, right? Note, God is worthy of worship because he is our creator. Remember, friends, we're just summarizing these angels. We want to get our students familiar because you know what? Honestly, three angels' messages are buzzword in Adventism. It is a, and, and friends, it is possible, you know, for a person to join the church and not know about no three angels. We don't want that to happen to your student. We want them to be on, to understand the concepts that the three angels are promoting. And friends, for some people, if they don't see three angels on a logo, boy, they, boy, the devil is in that place. But it's more than a logo. God wants these messages to be in our hearts. And nothing is more sad than a person who is protesting for three angels to be on a building, a logo, and them wicked, and them lie, and them are criminal, and just mean. That's that, that repulsive. They have an experience that which they, they want to see on a pulpit. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have it. Yes, I wish all our churches had, had, had the logo as opposed to this flame. But, you know, I'm, 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 what, what do I know? I'm, that's, that's way above my pay grade, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm saying, I'm not in Jerusalem council, I'm a country boy, I'm saying, but the point is, it would be nice, but in reality, it ain't so, right? But the point is, having these angels in our hearts are more and more important than having them on a building somewhere, and we should be able to have both, right? So God is worthy of our worship because he's our creator. Revelation 14, 11, Psalm 95, 5 and 6 says, to him, all other beings owe their existence. Wherever the Bible, wherever in the Bible he claims to reverence and worship above the God of heathens is presented. There is cited evidence of him being a creator. Now what we're doing now, friends, we are just laying the foundation for the Sabbath. 
You're going to see it. The first angel is calling us back to cre create worship. Now, there has been a paradigm shift in Christianity. And touch on this. Talk about this. What's the paradigm shift? Paul actually prophesied it. Romans 1.25. Paul says now, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and they worship the creature more than the creator. You see the paradigm shift? Friends, what's the paradigm shift? The paradigm shift is now there is more creature worship than creator worship. Look around. Who do we deify? Who do we reverence? Who do we venerate? We venerate actors, athletes, you know what I'm saying? Singers. You name it, movie stars, you name it, preachers. Man, some people even worship the tree. Tie themselves. Now, listen, I believe that we should do our best to, you know, <laughs> not to destroy the, 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 the environment. But, friends, I am not going to tie myself to no tree. I'm sorry. I don't love nature that much. Literally. Literally. You know, I remember one time we were coming from church. And we were in the car and we saw it. There was a turtle trying to cross the road. And I saw a lady with my own eyes. She almost probably pulled over. This is a pretty busy highway. And the turtle was, you know, as slow as a turtle. You know, he ain't in no rush. You know what I'm saying? It's a Sabbath for him. It's a rest. You know what I'm saying? The lady got out of the car and basically almost stopped traffic to get the turtle over. No, but I wouldn't kill a turtle. But I tell you something, if it comes between turtle and my life, bye. You know what I'm saying? But you know, some of these same people, you invite them to church, you invite them to Jesus Christ, a campaign, they don't have time for that. But they will go out there and give millions of dollars to dogs and cats. And don't get me wrong, we should... Praise God for them, them dogs who got the visa to Canada. Yes, dogs will go firing too, you know what I'm saying? Ain't nothing wrong with that, you know what I'm saying? But more so, eternal life. And they give more attention and emphasis to nature. Literally, look around. How in the world are you going to die and leave billions of dollars to, to, to rat research? What? And cats and chickens, what? When people are dying. You see it, friends. So there's a paradigm shift where we are now worshiping the creator more than the creature. And the angel is calling us away from that. He's saying, listen, I'm not saying we shouldn't respect people. We respect the police officer. We respect the judge. We respect our teachers. We give respect where respecters do. If a man goes to school and he earns his degree, I'm not going to diss the man. If he wants to be called a doctor, I'll call him Dr. So-and-so. I don't promise that. But since I'm not going to let that man's words be more important than God, no. We, but we're not saying we shouldn't respect our fellow beings. No. And the angel is not saying that. We're talking at the point of salvation where we put people in the place of God. We put the words of man in the place of God. We're willing to obey what man says than what God says. This is the danger. And it's often, and the reason why majority of the Christian world is not honoring God is because they are worshiping the creature more than the creator. And by the way, when the mark of the beast comes into place, what, was ha what is happening? These are people who are more homage, who are more willing to pay homage to the creature than the creator. Right? So we've just summarized the first angel's message. Again, we're not going too deep, but we do want to expose the student to this. Right? Because we're not, we will come back to this lesson, I guarantee you. Now, the second angel now, right? Let's focus on it now, right? Again, broad bush paint, right? It says, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, because that great city, because she has made all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, again, simplest form, the message of, this message has four characteristics. What are they, right? Fill it in now. The second angel's Message identifies Babylon as a city and as a woman. It does. Right? Babylon, Babylon is not confined to any particular religious group, but all religion. Right? Which does not make the word of God their only rule of faith and practice. Babylon is confusion. 
As a matter of fact, I want to read to you a statement. I think it's in your handout. It's, and I just say, you know, when I introduce it, I just say one religious author, you know, says this from a book called Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 71. Look at what this author says, right? You can just say, a you don't have to say Ellen Weiss, you can just say a religious author, right? And you're not lying, she was the most prolific religious author. And we're going to cover that, right? Please read it. Look, look what she says now. No church? No church has a right to consider itself apostolic while it violates the commandments of God. You know, apostolic mean the original, that they got their message from the, the apostles. You cannot say you are apostolic while you are violating the commandments of God. Please read now. So long as a church does this, the stain of apostasy is upon her. And in this respect, she is Babylonian rather than apostolic. Wow. Babylon means confusion. We're going to talk about that. The fall of Babylon, right? Ancient Babylon, spiritual Babylon. But this angel is identifying who Babylon is, right? The second angel's message announces the total fall of Babylon. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, fallen. Why is Babylon falling? What is Babylon? Babylon symbolized confused religion, right? Babylon falls not, Babylon fall is not literal, but a progressive spiritual and moral fall. A fall from religious righteousness, holiness, and grace. And you can definitely find Revelation 18, verse 2 to 3. That's the fall of Babylon. It is a progressive fall. She's getting worse, and she has gotten worse. Look what is done in the name of religion out there, friends. The most horrid, the most abominable things are now given license, right? The third thing that we want to highlight about the second angel is that now, the second angel uh, identifies Babylon as making all the nations drunk with her what? Wine. Wine. Wine symbolizes false doctrine. Please read now. Mystical Babylon. Mystic Babylon holds a golden cup. Ancient Babylon was also likened to a golden cup. And you can read these texts, right? And again, do read the text as you go through, right? Go ahead. The cup of Babylon contains its false doctrines and human traditions, which have been substituted for the pure word of truth found in the Holy Bible. Mm -hmm. Multitudes have been drinking the wine of her false doctrines and accepting the false policies of Babylon. There it is, brothers and sisters. That's what the whole world is drunk. Drinking from a cup that, is, that, that has inoculated people with false doctrine and a false doctrine produces false living. Reason from cause to effect, right? The fourth thing we want to highlight about the second angel, again, we're, we're just hitting the base. We're not going into deep, right? The second angel's message will, um, will make a final call to come out of Babylon. Friends, we have to come out of Babylon. You're going to find in Revelation 18 that the angel says, come out of Babylon. Why? Because Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Babylon is falling, a progressive fall, right? A fall from grace, a fall from, and I probably should have put this slide, I need to change it. This fall should go there, right? Fall of Babylon, and so we need to come out of the system. And you're, find out, you're going to find out that God is calling to come out of Babylon. Would you go into a system that's falling? If you know a building was falling, use analogies. If you know that, listen, go back to Surfside. That hotel was falling. Condo was falling so much that they decided to bring down the other one beside it because people were, there were safety reasons. If you know a system is falling, why would you still remain in it? You remain in it at the peril of your own life. And so this angel, and he repeats himself in Revelation chapter 18, he says, come out of her, my people, right? And so we're seeing that this angel is very, very serious, that this is no joke. When God says, come out of something, it means to come out. You know, it doesn't mean to stay, right? Now, let's now look at the third angel. Again, friends, remember, we are not going too deep. We just want to expose our student to these messages. So as we now touch on the mark of the beast, touch on what Babylon is, they can remember, oh, you're right. Remember what the angel said? Yes, to come out. Now, the third angel now, right? And the third angel followed them saying, with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive the mark in his forehead, 
the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with brimstone and fire in the presence of the holy angel and in the presence of the Lamb. Wow. Now, this angel has four, there are four characteristics to this, to this angel, this message now, right? Number one, the third angel, the third angel's message warns against the worship of the beast. Do not worship the beast. Obviously, beasts in prophecy symbolize kingdom. Don't attend the service. Don't be a part of it. Whoever the beast is, at this time, we're not going to introduce who the beast is yet because we haven't covered the mark of the beast. But your student will know that they have been warned. Whatsoever, whoever the beast is or the mark is, do not be affiliated with it. Run from it like, 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 like Corona. Listen, if you knew that them boys on there had some, have some COVID, you ain't going down there. You crazy. I don't care how much I love my friend. You got COVID, you stay right where you are. You quarantine yourself and you get retested. Then you stay where you are. You know what I'm saying? We know. So whoever the beast is, listen, have nothing to do with the beast. He warns men against worshiping the beast, right? No. Please read now. All the world... All the world will make a decision on this point. Will they obey the beast slash religious power command to violate one of the precepts in God's Ten Commandment law? Or will they faithfully keep that law? This will be the issue in the final test to all mankind. Did you see how this is serious? This is very serious, right? The second thing the third angel highlights is that now, the third angel's message warns against receiving the mark and the image of the beast. He's saying, don't receive the mark, don't get the image, have nothing to do with this beast, even at the peril of your own life. At this point, we don't know what the mark of the beast is, Well, you should know what it is, but they don't know. Now they may ask, let me ask a question, what is the mark of the beast, what would you say? Hold on, let me show you in scripture. No, we're gonna have a lesson on this. Hold on, and they will write, Note, in the last, hours of, the last hours of the crisis, the mark of the beast will be enforced by civil law. God's warning is raised against this mark, and he calls men to worship the creator, not man or a system. You see how serious these messages are? Life and death. Third thing the third angel highlights now, the third angel messages warns against filling in God's wrath upon those who do not heed the warning. What is the wrath of God? Revelation 15, 1 says, the seven last plagues are contained the wrath of God. We have a whole lecture on the seven last plagues. So guess what? Now you see what now? now? We are planting these seeds in their mind. Right? You see how things are connected? The only person who receive the plagues are those who get the mark. To get the mark, you have to be willing to worship the creature than the creator, you have to turn your back on these three messages. Friends, if you embrace these three messages and you're alive, you can never get the mark of the beast. You may be martyred, yeah, you said, but you'll never get the wrath of God. You can never get the wrath of God. Friends, did you know right now, if you are a man or a woman and you keep yourself to yourself in terms of remaining faithful, no intercourse, you can never get an STD. It's called der sexually transmitted diseases. You can only get it by intercourse. So if you are single, syllabus, monkish, guess what? You can't get STD. You can never, ever, 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 ever get it. Friends, if you and I just embrace these three angels, the third, you will never get the wrath of God. Never. Because the wrath of God is only, is only poured out on those who disregard the third angel's message and the second and the first and turn their back on God and say, I want the creature worship. Right? Note, all, all must choose between receiving the wrath of man and the wrath of God. And let me tell you something, friends. I'd rather get the wrath of man than the wrath of God. You know, when I was growing up, boy, and, and, and um, you know, we, we got in trouble. You were going home and you could either get spanked by your, 
or your father, your mother, your grandparents, your grandmother, your grandfather. We have a tendency, women are weak, you know, unless they've, they're kind of country women, but they ain't weak about it. <laughs> we have said, but boy, I put it on you. But we rather, we rather, we rather get disciplined by our, by mommy. You know, mommy is the, mommy, please, mommy, the baby. yeah, yeah, okay, all right, one and two. Father, in the one, hear that. Y'all get broomstick, Lord have mercy. You get in the kitchen sink, you get in the, you get in the sun, moon, and the star. You get in the wrath of daddy. Right? So, friends, what I'm trying to say is, the wrath of, the wrath of, the wrath of man is like mommy spanking you. That ain't nothing. You don't want to get the wrath of God. Because when he pays off, he pays him full, right? The decision must be made between obeying man and obeying God. And it goes back to the first angel. Are we going to fear man or are we going to fear God? Remember, at this point, your student don't really understand the controversy yet. Because we haven't covered those lessons. But what? We are priming them. We are prepping them. Because we, we are in lesson number 11. At some point, we must get to the Sabbath, death, health, hellfire, God's true church, these testing truths. And again, the decision will be, are you going to obey what your pastor says or what God says, what the Pope says or what God says? Man, creature, God, creator. You see? That's why these messages are so important right now, right? <clears throat> the fourth thing the third angel announces, the third angel identifies those who will not receive the mark of the beast. He does. How do we know that? Revelation chapter 14 verse 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What commandments? the one we covered in previous lesson. So once we endeavor, make up our minds to keep God's commandments, we can never receive the wrath of God. We cannot get the mark of the beast. Right? Make sense? Please read a note. This, this verse. This verse is decisive. It clearly spells out exactly who will receive the mark of the beast and who will not. Mm -hmm. Nothing can be clearer than the fact that if we trust in Christ and in his strength, obey all the commandments of God, his moral code of right and wrong, we will not receive the mark of the beast. All right. Uh, go ahead now in the messages. In the messages of the three angels of Revelation 14, we find the two groups once again. The mark of the beast for obedience to earthly powers versus a small group which will remain true to the commandments of God. They will keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. This dedicated group clings to Jesus, their wonderful Savior, and by his enabling grace, they obey his moral law, the Ten Commandments. All right. And friends, we know that for over a hundred, for over a century, these three angels have been spread around the world and the message continues to go. Many sincere Christian, upon learning these messages, are coming out of Babylon and are being gathered with God's last day commandment keeping people. These angels will not go in vain. They are global. People from every walks of life are realizing the time has come for them to fear God and give glory. The time has come for them to, to live in such a way because they are in the judgment. The time has come for them to come out of religious Re confused religious groups to stop sitting under confused religious Babylonian pastors and teachers. The time has now come where we are preparing ourselves that we will, we will not receive the mark of the beast. Whatever the mark of the beast may be, up until this point, they don't know what it is yet, right? Because we haven't covered that lecture. But, but they do know to get the mark of the beast is serious, right? Now, sad reality. So, We've just surveyed the three angels. Again, we're not going too deep because bear in mind we're dealing with people. These lessons are designed not so much for Seventh-day Adventists. They are really designed for people who are not familiar with our message. So we have to take these things in strides. You can only give them so much as they can digest. And remember, the nourishment that one gets from his food is not from um, gobbling it down. It's from its thorough digestion. So if you eat a whole plate of food, cut and swallow, 
and I eat half a plate, masticate my food with my saliva, right? Guess what? I only eat half of the plate. I get more nourishment from the half I ate than from the food you ate because your, your stomach don't have any teeth, right? Now, sad reality, we want to use a story. Stories always tend to, to clinch, to summarize what we're saying. Sad reality, please read now a man. A man in Duxbury, Massachusetts, refused to pay one cent postage on a letter. It was turned to the Plymouth Dead Letter Office. Postmaster William Godwin disclosed that when the letter was opened, it contained a $450 check. Mm. Let not this priceless message of the three angels, so fraught with eternal life, be but a dead letter to you, to be sent back to the sender, Jesus Christ. Friends, we don't want that. We want to adhere to what these angels are saying. What then? Now, we've, we're now going to use, if Old Testament characters were here today, how would they respond to these messages? And they're in your hand, right? If Moses were here, what would he do in regards to these three angels? What would you think Moses' posture would be? Well, nothing has changed. It's the everlasting gospel. In Hebrews 11, 24, Moses says, Now by faith, when he was come to years, Friends, once we've come to years, you've come to an understanding. He refused to be called Pharaoh's daughter. He refused to live in a life contrary. He has been enlightened. Look what happened now. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. It is true. These three angels will bring you in conflict with family members, with your job with the state, not that you are intentionally going to be trying to be hostile, but friends, obedience to truth will, will always inevitably bring you in contact with error. Moses would take, I believe Moses tonight would take his stand with the three angels. If Elijah were here, what would he do in regards to these three angels? Well, he would do what he's always done. What did he do? First Kings 18.21. And Elijah called upon the people and said, How long would you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be the Lord, follow him. And if God, if Baal, follow him. And the people answered another word. In other words, if you believe that these messages are from God, then follow them. Go all the way. Make up your mind that I'm going to fear God. Whatever Babylon is, once I know what it is, I'm coming out. And God, by the hook or the crook, I'm going to keep your commandments by the grace of God so I cannot receive the mark of the beast. If Solomon was here, what would he do in regards to these three angels? You know, Solomon understood. The angel said, fear God and give him glory. We learned the fear of the Lord means to keep his commandments. Friends, did you know that when we willfully turn away our hearts if the commandments are brought to us and we know what God requires of us. If we disregard God's commandments, look what happened to our prayers. Solomon says now, he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Friends, let me say this. One of the last persons you want to ask to pray for you is a man who, who has willfully turned his back on the commandments, his prayers an abomination. Because Solomon don't want his prayer to be an abomination. Guess what he did now? He would, he would fall in line. Make sense? Definitely, right? If Jesus was here today, how would Jesus respond to these three angels? Well, he tells us he will respond the same way he responded over 2,000 years ago. John 15, 10 tells us now, if you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments. These things I have spoken unto you, that you may remain in you, and that your joys might be full. Jesus would actually adhere to the three angels' message, because guess what? The three angels' message are calling us back to God, back to worshiping God, back to keeping of God's commandment, right? If Peter were here, what would Peter do? Peter said it. He would do the same thing he said to those Judaizers. Then Peter 
And the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Peter would obey the three angels' messages regardless of what opposition, what enmity they may excite. Right? If John was here, he wrote it, John, what would he do? Well, he would do what he did, what landed him on Patmos. Why did he go to Patmos? Not for vacation or because he wanted to hang out. He went there because he refused to obey man than God. John said now, blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in the gates of the city. If John was here tonight, John would say, yes, sign me up by the grace of God. I'm going to accept. I'm going to adhere to what these three angels are saying. Note, please read on. God has placed. God has placed in our hands a banner upon which is inscribed. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. All right. This is the thing. This is a distinct separated message, a message that is to be given in no uncertain sound. It is to lead the people away from the broken cisterns that contain no water to the unfailing fountain of the water of life. We dare not wait to make a decision on this. Heaven is waiting and the final crisis is nearing. It is nearing, friends. And we believe the three angels' message are doing their work globally. Now, we always want to close with a story. And the reason why we use, you know, men like Dale Moody, because these men, for the most part, were... They are not like the other evangelicals. D.L. Moody was a very good man, right? And he, many souls were saved in the kingdom. So we tend to use, we may quote Spurgeon, Moody, Baxter, you know, people whom they know in their field and respect, right? D.L. Moody told a story, a very, very serious story. And the reason why we cannot delay when, when there's an urgency. Now, D.L. Moody did something which he regretted and it cost many people their lives. And as a result, he changed his whole structure. Please read now, as D.L. Moody. As Dwight L. Moody spoke in Farewell Hall in Chicago on the evening of October 8th, 1871, he repeated the words of Pilate in his moment of procrastination. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And then Moody said, I wish you would take this text home with you and turn it over in your minds. The next week we will come to Calvary and the cross and we will decide what to do with Jesus. So he, gave, he said, I'm not going to make an appeal now. Take this text, read it over. When we come back, we'll discuss it. Friends, look what happened now. Then Sankey began to sing. Sankey was a musician who traveled with D.L. Moody, right? Please read. I have some of his CDs. Very, very good, good singer, right? Go ahead now. But his song was never finished. Uh -huh. It was interrupted by the rush and the roar of fire engines. Chicago was ablaze. Wow. The great Chicago fire had begun. Some say because a cow kicked over a lantern in a barn. All right. Moody later said, I will never again give an audience a week to decide whether to accept Christ. Uh -huh. None of us can know what the next day may bring. All right. We must choose God's side in the warfare between sin and righteousness. Uh -huh. We must do it now and cling to Christ. We must stick with it. Each hesitation gradually hardens the heart. Procrastination can result in eternal loss. And where I'm from, they say procrastination is a thief of time. So friends, we want to let them know that these three angels are not to be taken lightly. And you hold them to the covenant that by the grace of God, I am going to obey these three angels found in Revelation. Now again, they may not understand all, but what we can read, these warnings are very, very, these warnings and admonition, or rather these admonitions and warning are very, very serious. And they need to even now decide by the grace of God. When I leave here, I'm going to start fearing God. I'm going to give him glory. I'm going to worship him. There's a judgment going on. I need to know about it. I'm going to come out of Babylon. Once I find what Babylon is, I'm getting out of it. And secondly, by the grace of God, I'm putting myself in a position whereby when the mark of the beast comes into play, whatever the beast is, whatever the mark is, I don't want to have nothing to do with it. Friends, you want to have your students be in that mind frame. And then now, obviously, 
the appeal cause is important. You understand and believe what the Bible teaches about tonight's subject and it is your desire to follow what it says. You have them check it. Remember, we just, we're just skimming the surface. You won't cover this in one setting. You may have to take two settings, but we're just getting them introduced, familiar to the verbiage of the three angels' message. And you always give the opportunity if the information that was presented was not clear. What part wasn't clear? You can take time to, 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 to go over it so they can sign their appeal cards. And friends, once you finish, we pray we may want to introduce next week's subject. Now, the next lesson we're going we're gonna to speak about now is the judgment. Now, but we're going to do the judgment from a different perspective from the, from the context of the sanctuary. The first angel says, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment is come. Another name for the judgment is the cleansing of the sanctuary. Right? We're taking a different approach to teach this lesson because I really want you, especially, to understand this prophecy. Right? And this is where we're going to go. I really want you to understand this is the judgment. This prophecy lets us know that we're in a judgment. Friends, this prophecy will be taught during the loud cry. There is no question about it. We're going to have to prove the 70 weeks, 483, 457 BC, 2780, this this, because remember, you know, remember we did it, the pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? They apply all this to the Antichrist. You have to know this, friends. This is the judgment. And I believe this is one of, one of, will be one of the primary subjects that will be given you the loud cry. That's why we need to know it. And as you know it and you teach it, it becomes clearer to you. So yes, we're, we're, we're going to go here. We are going to break this prophecy because this is a very, very important prophecy that you must understand, right? So, friends, without any uh, 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 point, we hope that you were blessed tonight um, by this evening's message. Again, friends, go over your study guides. Go over your lessons. Be like the Bereans. Dig it up. Excavate it. Turn it over. Get it in your mind. Mark your text. Mark the Bible. And pray that God will open a door whereby you can share this we, the PowerPoints are available, right? The PowerPoints are available, and we, we've sent out, we have the master copies, and we do have the student copies. All you need now is to get you a computer or a tablet or some device where you can upload it, the, the, the things are, a TV or a projector, get your King James Bible, pray over it, and go to work. And watch God use you to save many souls. And bear in mind, the soul you save may be your very own. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, again for your goodness and your mercies towards us, for allowing us, Lord, just to be able to meet in this fashion, to use technology whereby we can seek to inspire, equip, motivate your people to do the work of evangelism. I pray that you will grant them a uh, good night's rest um, to take on tomorrow's challenges May your Holy Spirit be with them. May your angels protect them in their going out and their coming in. Pro protect them from COVID, COVID-19, all kind of sickness. Lord, just be with us as a people. We commit mind, soul, and body under your watchful care. Bring us here back at the appointed time. We will hear more from your word. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Friends, have a good night. And as I've always, we say in the words of Job, Behold, the eye forward.